A blessed Sabbath to you, dear brethren. I welcome you, and I thank the Lord for giving us another opportunity to worship together as one family of the Lord. Join with me, please, as we read Psalm 5. These are some really beautiful words by the psalmist. Psalm 5, verse 2. The psalmist says, Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Now it's beautiful. The two beautiful truths that are highlighted in this text. One is the plea on the part of the psalmist who is seeking God's heart, saying, Lord, please hear the cry, my King and my God. Please hear my cry. There's a plea. But friends, if you read carefully, there's also an assurance. There's a steadfast faith. And you can hear that resonating in the words of the psalmist. For as he says, hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. Notice the assurance in his voice as he says, for unto thee will I pray. I like those words because I see more than just a plea. I see the psalmist saying, Lord, only unto you will I turn. Only unto you will I pray. And it does not matter what happens to me. I will not knock another door, for I have learned to seek you wholeheartedly. It is my prayer, friends, that as we come together, may we learn to have that same assurance as we come to the Lord saying, Lord, only unto thee will we pray. God bless you, friends. Let us pray as we begin. Mighty God, thank you for blessing us with your presence, for giving us another sacred Sabbath and the opportunity to be blessed, fed, nourished, and strengthened by thee. Thank you for your manservant, Pastor Stephen, a humble manservant of thee, who you have empowered for such a time as this. Thank you for the word you've prepared through him for us. And we plead that as we worship together, that God will be lifted up exalted, magnified before the world. Help us to listen to your voice, to heed your voice, and to be found walking on that narrow path. Please, Lord, accomplish that grand work you want to accomplish this Sabbath in our lives, that we may live to testify to the world about the God who is mighty to save. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen.
Just want to welcome all the viewers today, wherever you're joining in from. It's a real privilege to be able to speak with you and just begin to open up the prayer of Jesus in Luke 11 and in Matthew 6, which we often call the Lord's Prayer. And my aim today really is going to be to kind of give an introduction to the prayer and then drill down a little bit into the first section of that prayer. And we know that the prayer um, is so vital for us. That prayer is so vital for us in our daily life. Um, here's a quotation from Martin Luther. He once said during the times of the Reformation when he was uh, you know, printing material and trying to spread the gospel and communicating and fighting foes that were against him, he, would, he had said that I have so much business, I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. It's an interesting perspective, isn't it? Too often when we feel that we're very busy, we just feel like, well, we need to get into doing what we have to do. And unfortunately, our prayer life begins to become shortened or shorter. And yet Luther's perspective was totally the opposite. So much to do, and it's so important that I really need to spend three hours a day in prayer. And so, you know, it's my desire in our presentation and our time together <coughs> here on the Final Herald that each one of us would be called back to realizing how important prayer is in our spiritual life. Um, just think of a lot of quotations from the writings of Ellen White, where darkness, the darkness of Satan, begins to enclose those who neglect to pray. Interesting, it's, it's not that they're resisting prayer. It's not that actually they're out doing something, um, you know, terribly egregious in their lifestyle. But as they neglect prayer, darkness begins to surround them. So this message of Luther is very important. This one's from John Wesley, where he brought out, he says, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. So uh, we know that God's initiative is always working. And even our very desires to pray are the result of him drawing us. That's what Romans 8 tells us, that the Holy Spirit you know, speaking with our spirit and prompting us, drawing us. But when we sense that drawing, we should cooperate. And then that frees God within the constraints of the cosmic conflict of the great controversy to continue to act. And this is from a Richard uh, Baynard who said, I love to be alone in my cottage where I can spend much time in prayer, where he had that deep intimacy with God. And I feel that as, as Christians, particularly Christians living at the time of Earth's history in which we do, that this intimacy of God, with God is so vital. It's such of a, such great importance for each one of us. And I confess, as I was preparing this presentation, I was reminded you know, of my own need for prayer. Um, I'd like to draw your attention with me uh, to the book of Revelation. I know we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer, 
But if you're following along, you have a Bible with you, I invite you to turn with me, first of all, to Revelation chapter 5, um, and then in Revelation chapter 8. But in Revelation chapter 5, there's a tremendous scene, and we can spend a lot of time, maybe we'll come back and we'll do a walk through the book of Revelation uh, as well. <clears throat> but in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8, when the Lamb comes to the throne of God and takes the little book that had been sealed and it's written inside and out, there's this song, a hymn of praise that breaks forth in heaven. And in verse 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, that's part of the divine council that surrounds the throne, they fell before the Lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So there's this mixture, here's this scene, this picture in heaven of um, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, this divine council acting in some kind of a priestly function. They have these bowls of incense, but there's this connection between the incense and our prayers. And that's really drawn from Psalm 141, I believe it is, where David prays, let my prayer ascend to you like incense. And then it goes on and they sing this beautiful song. But also draw your attention to chapter 8, where there's a clearer scene before the throne of God. Um, in Revelation 8, starting in verse 2, is the unfolding of the seven trumpets. And then in verse three, it says, and another angel came and stood at the altar. This, I believe, is the altar of incense, having a golden censer, and much incense was given to him. So this angel, probably a representation of Christ, comes to this altar, the altar of incense, has the censer, much incense is given to him as well, and that he might add it to the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. So we see this mixture. There's prayer activity, but something needs to be mixed with that prayer, and it's the incense. And as we begin this exploration in prayer, it's important for us to understand that our prayers in and of themselves are completely worthless, but our prayers mingled with the incense of Christ's righteousness, Christ's character, is full of power. And this is so vital that everything we do, we need to have this dependence upon our Savior, upon what he's done for us in his life, in his ministry, what he is doing for us in heaven now, both of those aspects. Desire of Ages 362, we find this quotation, no other life was so crowded with labor and responsibility as was that of Jesus, yet how often he was found in prayer, how constant was his communion with God. So thinking back to Luther's point of, I've got so much to do, I need to spend so much time in prayer. No other life had so many responsibilities or so much labor as did Jesus. Yet when we look at the life of Christ in the Gospels, we constantly find he is being spending time with God in prayer. We think of uh, the passage in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, rising up early a great while before day, he departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. And so prayer is this integral, inseparable, essential aspect of the life of Christ. And then with this quotation, it says, the work of God is to be carried out to completion by the cooperation of divine and human agencies. That's a really important thought. Cooperation of divine and human. God always takes the initiative, always moves toward us, and then we respond. Those who are apparently are self-sufficient, excuse me, those who are self-sufficient may be apparently active in the work of God. But if they are prayerless, their activity is of no avail. You can underscore that exclamation pointed. 
See, the danger is that we become professional at doing ministry. And we should become professional. We should do our ministry better. But when we become self-sufficient, if we begin to think, well, I know how to run a ministry, or I know how to give a Bible study, or I know how to do an evangelistic series, and I, I know how to craft a sermon, this is the danger that we fall into. This is the danger outlined in Revelation chapter 3, talking about Laodicea, where Laodicea is self-deceived um, and self-complacent. She thinks everything is fine, but she doesn't understand her real condition. But if they're prayerless, their activity is of no avail. So all that activity, all that preaching without the work of God really does not bring fruit. Um, goes on to say, and this brings our attention back to Revelation 5 and Revelation chapter 8. Could they look into the censer of the angel who stands at the golden altar before the rainbow, excuse me, before the rainbow circled throne? They would see that the merit of Jesus must be mingled with our prayers and efforts, or they are worthless. Just again, highlight that the merit of Jesus, the righteousness of Christ, his obedience, his love, his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection, that needs to be mingled with our prayers, or our prayers are worthless. Only the work accomplished by much prayer, which is sanctified by the merit of Christ, will stand the test of the judgment. And that's what we want, is people living in the time of the judgment and thinking about what that will be like, all the things taking place in our world today. We want to be sanctified by the merit of Christ, and we want our work to stand the test of the judgment. So it's kind of a lengthy introduction to prayer, but let's kind of jump in here. And I particularly like focusing in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 11, where is Luke's rendition of what we call the Lord's Prayer. And there's a long history in Christianity about the importance of this prayer. There was an elder in Jerusalem in the 300s. His name was Cyril, and he wrote a series of uh, lectures we still find some copies of those today. And he talked about the importance of the Lord's Prayer. In fact, in his day, in mid 350s, it was really only the baptized who could repeat the Lord's Prayer. So that's a terribly unfortunate thing because really the Lord's Prayer has a much broader reach. Um, so my family is, I, I grew up in a Jewish family. Perhaps one time I can share my testimony with you, We're converted to Christianity. And, but even in my family, my Jewish family currently, they respect the Lord's Prayer. It's, it's kind of like common territory. Muslims also would be impacted by the Lord's Prayer. It's, it's kind of a universal prayer. So to restrict it to only those who are baptized seems to be misguided in my mind. The important point is that early Christian writers really felt the value of this prayer. There's an ancient Christian document called the Didache, which talked about, it's called the teaching, how churches should be in order, how they should be ordered. And part of that document also brings out the importance of the Lord's Prayer. But when we think about the Lord's Prayer, most of the time, our mind runs to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, and we'll look at that momentarily. I like to look a little bit more in the Gospel of Luke for a couple of reasons. One, generally we look at Matthew, not Luke. But secondly, notice the prayer life of Jesus that Luke emphasizes. So all these points here on the screen before you, these are unique to the Gospel of Luke. When Jesus prayed at his baptism, we describe that, we talk about that Jesus prayed at his baptism, but it's Luke that tells us that Jesus prayed at the baptism. Luke tells us of Jesus praying before healing, before ordaining the 12, 
before uh, spending the night in prayer, before the question to the disciples, who am I? Before the transfiguration, before he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus' first words on the cross are a prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the Gospel of Luke, in a very specific way, emphasizes and stresses the prayer life of Jesus. And if we were to compare Matthew 6 and Matthew chapter, excuse me, Luke 6 and Luke 11 and Matthew chapter 6, pardon me, and the, the two examples of the Lord's Prayer, you will notice certain differences between these two prayers. First of all, the setting is completely different. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is before a large crowd, and he gives the Lord's Prayer in that setting. In the Gospel of Luke, he's alone with his disciples. They've heard him pray. So the context is very different. Um, the way the prayer is structured is different. Luke has five petitions. Matthew has seven petitions. Some of our Bibles may smooth them out and make, make them look more similar, but in the Greek, there's some differences there. In the Gospel of Luke, the emphasis that follows the Lord's Prayer is on persistence. Keep praying, keep knocking, seek, ask, you shall find. Uh, there's the parable on prayer in Luke chapter 6, in Luke chapter 11, rather. In Matthew chapter 6, the context is about display. You know, don't do your alms before people that you could be seen by men. Don't do things for open show. When you pray, go in your closet, pray by yourself. So the settings are very, very different. And that leads people to ask questions. Well, what's going on here? Did one gospel writer change it? Well, the simple truth is Jesus could have given this instruction at many different times. And the gospel writers chose which one to include. Just because Jesus said it on the Sermon on the Mount doesn't mean he couldn't have repeated it slightly differently later in his ministry. Another major difference is the intention or the audience for which the, these gospels are written. Matthew is written specifically for a Jewish readership, and he constructs, he constructs the gospel of Matthew in that way, Luke is written much more toward Gentile readers, and we can find that in the very introduction to Luke, where Luke says, um, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, where uh, he's writing to somebody named Theophilus, and he's describing why he's writing the book. So when we look at the two copies of the Lord's Prayer, if we come across some differences that shouldn't surprise us, it shouldn't concern us. The settings are different. The thrust of why each gospel writer is putting it where they do is different, but it's not contradictory. When we think about prayer, and we think about particularly these prayers, Luke 11, Matthew 6, we're really finding that Jesus He's doing something very different. He's inviting us to walk into a world in which words are few, but they're powerful. Both of these prayers are very short. So let's go to the Gospel of Matthew momentarily. Matthew chapter 6. And in verses 1 through 8, as I mentioned already, Matthew's concern is display. So in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father which is in heaven. What's he saying to us? That if you're living your Christian life to be seen by other people, that's the reward you're going to get. You will be seen by other people. But there's a higher calling to why we live our Christian life. We are going to live our Christian life to glorify God. 
to hallow his name, to make his name holy, as it says in the prayer. And he goes on in the next couple of verses, he talks about almsgiving, uh, but do it in secret. And then particularly uh, verses seven and eight, when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. And oftentimes, uh, people would recite very long prayers in an attempt to placate or honor their God. And the concept was, if I just throw en enough um, <clears throat> titles out there or expressions of praise out there, and I make my prayer very long and flowery, then it'll be heard because of my eloquence. But that's exactly contrary to what Jesus is telling us here. He says, don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. You don't have to really beat around the bush. You, we need to be respectful, of course, um, in prayer, but pretty much paganism teaches that the person that prays the longest or the loudest gets the answer necessary. Long, wordy exhortations. We think back to, it just comes to my mind, 1 Kings chapter 18, where we find the contest between Elijah and Baal the prophets of Baal, and the prophets of Baal, they spend all day cutting themselves, screaming, dancing, trying to get the attention of their God to bring fire down from heaven. It doesn't work. Elijah kneels down, he prays a short prayer, he gets a response. So one of the key things here as we think about the Lord's Prayer and we learn how to pray the Lord's Prayer, how to incorporate it into our life. One of the key points that we, we really need to understand is the value of our prayer is not connected to the length of the prayer or the floweriness or the eloquence of it. The value of the prayer is connected to two things, our dependence on Christ and our own need. You think of the story in the Gospels of the, uh, the man that had a son that was tormented by a demoniac, and he brings the son to Jesus, and Lord, can you do anything? And Jesus says, well, if you believe, all things are possible. The man's prayer, short, brief, intense, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When we learn to pray, like that, out of a sense of our need, in full dependence on God, those are the prayers that are answered. And the Lord's Prayer is an example of that. So um, let's go back to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 11, as I mentioned. We could stay in Matthew, but I'd like to use Luke again because we're less familiar with it. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came about that while he was in a certain place, praying in a certain place, after he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus is somewhere by himself. Uh, you know, maybe we don't really know the timing here. He's in a particular place and he's praying. And the disciples come upon him, come to him, and they hear him praying. They're silent. They're listening to this prayer. They're listening to this open hearted flow of communion from the Son to the Father. It must have been an amazing experience just to, to listen to Jesus pray to the Father. And so they say, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So it was very obviously uh, a common thing for 
a leader, some kind of a teacher like John was and like Jesus certainly was, to share with his, his disciples some method of praying. And so he, in verse two, he said to them, when you pray, say, or in the King James and the Gospel of Matthew, when you pray after this manner, pray. And then in verse two, Father, hallowed be your name. So um, some Greek manuscripts insert the word our Father. Uh, it's clearly there in Matthew. It's questionable whether it's here in the Gospel of Luke. But the key point is here that the prayer starts with this admonition, Father. Father, hallowed be your name. And that's what I want to spend the rest of our time on, just this little section of the prayer. Again, there was an early Christian writer. I, I think his name was... Um, I believe it was Origen in about the four, 400s, who said that Jews never referred to God as father and that this was a new teaching that Jesus introduced. Well, that's not true, uh, certainly not entirely true. Uh, as we can see from some of these Old Testament verses that I have up on the screen, you know, Psalm 103, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. This connection between father and son, a couple of passages in the book of Isaiah, which talks about God as father. Malachi chapter 2 in verse 10, you know, you are our father. And then 1 Chronicles chapter 29 in verse 10. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 10. Let me just read it for you. It's a prayer at the end of the dedication of the temple. <clears throat> so David blessed the Lord in sight of all the assembly and said, and David said, blessed are you, O Lord, God of Israel, our father forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in heavens and earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourselves over all. You can hear echoes of the Lord's prayer in that prayer that David prays. And some scholars think that Jesus either drew from it or somehow there was a connection. But the point is that father or our father was common in Judaism. It was not a completely new idea. However, Jesus did make it more intimate. And that's really important. Jesus takes this concept of father, <coughs> which might have been a bit removed or sterile, maybe perhaps, in Hebraic thought, maybe that's too strong of an expression. But Jesus makes it much more intimate. As I mentioned earlier in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And through the Gospel of Matthew, I think in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus uses the expression father some 42 times in the Gospel of Matthew. Here on the screen is just some examples. The father sees in secret, yet it rewards openly. Matthew 6, 1, 4, 6, and 18. Our father forgives us. Our father knows what we need. Our father gives us good gifts. Uh, our father prepares the meals for the birds and he clothes the grass and he also knows about us and he's not willing that any of us should be lost. Very gracious picture of God. It's true. Unfortunately, many of us have not had 
a warm relationship with our fathers for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe we're close, more closely attached with our mother. And because the, the biblical writer here, John, and excuse me, Matthew and Luke, quote, Jesus is saying, our father, that doesn't exclude, doesn't exclude by any means the more um, tender or compassion aspects that a mother have as well important point for us to realize is that from the perspective of Jesus, Abba, Father, is this warm, endearing, supportive term. And the first thing Jesus wants us to know when we approach God in prayer is that he's like a beloved parent. He's the one that you can run to when you've hurt yourself. He's the one that you can turn to when you need comfort. He's the one that can help you in your time of loss. Father, Father, very important. And as the Gospel of Matthew clearly brings out, there's the word our Father in Matthew. Maybe it's there in Luke, maybe it isn't. But clearly it's there in Matthew. So that even broadens it out. What do I mean by that? When we pray this prayer, our Father, well, first of all, we pray Father. It brings us into this intimate relationship with the Creator. Secondly, when we say our Father, it brings us into this broad relationship with the entire human race. Now, I mentioned earlier that there was some teaching in early Christianity that only Christians after they were baptized could pray the Lord's Prayer. I think that's a tremendous disservice. As I said, you know, I, I know of Jewish people and um, Muslims and some atheists. I read a story about a, a, a woman in um, Rigva, Latvia, who grew up under communism and her grandmother died, and at the service, the only thing that was read was the Lord's Prayer, but it made an impression on her. She ultimately became a Christian. So, you know, wherever we are in the world, this prayer has power to reach. And when we pray the prayer correctly, our Father, what we are saying is we are part of the larger web of humanity. You see, the church should have no place for any racial or societal distinctions. Based on the Lord's Prayer, it tears down any separation between classes of people, um, whether those classes be based on wealth or race or education. Our Father, we are part of the human family. The human race is made in the image of God. And although that image may be marred in the people I meet, every person carries some spark of that image of God. And because of that, every person, no matter how they are acting, demands my consideration, my kindness, my service toward them, our Father, not just my Father, not just your Father, not just our Father within the church, not just our Father that are paying attention to the final herald, but our Father, wrapping the entire world in this concept that God is our creator, and that as such, we should look at everyone else through that lens of being a child of God. Then the next part of the prayer, just go back, sorry to get back to Luke chapter 11. In verse two, our father or father, is a very interesting phrase here, hallowed be your name. Um, and the way it's expressed in the Greek, uh, it's a very unusual Greek expression, let me just say that. And I tried to have it here on a slide for you. 
another way to say it is, may it be made holy, your name. It's kind of like an imperative and a passive at the same time. In English, there's a command. It needs to be made holy, but there's the passive. And it's a very unusual expression. It's a little bit like saying, let fire be hot. Well, it's a characteristic of fire that it is hot. It's a characteristic of fire. Or like saying, let the light be bright. Well, it's a characteristic of light to be bright. So it's an odd expression. Really what Jesus is trying to say is here, one way to kind of maybe say it is, let or allow God's holiness to shine out. We're not simply praying here that God's name would be holy. It's very clear through scripture that God's name already is holy. Um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Holy, holy, holy. The holy one of Israel, all through the book of Isaiah. So holiness is a characteristic that's inseparable from God. But when we pray this prayer, our Father, hallowed be your name, really what we're saying is, let the holiness that exists in God's name be reflected in me. And so this is a fundamental question for us as we pray this prayer. Again, are we praying this prayer out of full dependence? Are we leaning completely on the righteousness of Christ? Do we realize our broader connection with society as a whole, you know, broadband society? And are we reflecting God's holiness? Let's turn back to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36, 20 through 26. Um, beautiful passage in the book of Ezekiel. And one of the key points here is that God's name is not being made holy because of the lives of his people. So we'll start in verse 20, Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 20, talking about when they were taken captive, the Israelites, that is, when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name. So his name is holy, but it's being profaned because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of their land. In other words, look what happened to God's people. God didn't protect them. Verse 21, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they went. Verse 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. I will prove myself holy among you in their sight. It's the last part of verse 23. So the holiness of God, hallowed be your name. May it be made holy your name. What we're praying here is, yes, God, vindicate your name and let it start in me. Let me realize that you really are holy and that your holiness is a reflection of how you want me to be as well. And then it goes on, I'll gather you from the nations, verse 25, and then I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I'll cleanse you from your filthiness, from your idols. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, amen, hallelujah, and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. When we pray this prayer, this is what we're also praying for. Lord, I recognize that I've profaned your name. I recognize that I have not lived up 
to the privileges or responsibilities, the glories that you have for me. I realize that I have misrepresented you. Lord, I want your name to be made holy. Cleanse me from my filthiness. Take the stony heart out of my flesh. Sprinkle the water of your spirit upon me. Put your spirit within me. Cause me to walk in your ways. When we approach the Lord's Prayer, we have a tremendous need. We're depending on Christ's righteousness, Christ's merits completely. We recognize that we are part of a great web of humanity, our Father, and that God wants us to approach him as Father. Um, I'm just reminded as I'm thinking of this in Zephaniah 3.17, where it says that he will rejoice over you with singing, and he will rest in his love. When we come to God and we say, Father, our Father, it brings joy to his heart. Just like when one of my grandchildren says, oh, Grandpa, and they give me a hug, it brings warmth to my soul. So God responds the same way to you when you pray. He's inviting you. He's calling you. He's calling me into this deeper intimacy with him. In order to experience that, we need to let his name be hallowed in us. But what's so important about this name anyway? When we think of the name Hashem in Hebrew, this is where humanity and God meet one another. We think of Moses' experience at the burning bush. His first question was, well, who are you? What do I tell anybody about your name? You know, I need to know your name because if I know your name, I know who you are. And when Isaiah has that experience, he realizes the holiness of God. He realizes he needs purification. He realizes his unholiness, but ultimately he is sent out. And that's what God wants to do with you. He wants to do with me. He wants us to meet together, the place of intersection, our Father, holy may your name be, and may it be made holy in myself. In the book, Mount of Blessings, page 107, it says, you cannot hallow his name. You cannot represent him to the world. So to hallow his name means to represent him to the world. But we can't do this unless in life and character, you represent the very life and character of God. This you can only do through the acceptance of the grace and the righteousness of Christ. Brings us back full circle to the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the angel before the throne with the incense there and the incense, re incense representing the grace and the righteousness of Christ. We can't have this prayer be fulfilled unless we're living a life that represents the life and character of God. And that is impossible unless we're depending on the righteousness of Christ and his grace is living in us. But if we are depending on his righteousness, if we are allowing his grace to control us, then we can truly reflect his character to the world. What's your choice, my friend? Here at the Final Herald, we're all called to be heralds of the gospel. We live in this closing hour in this world's history. But the greatest testimony that can be born, you know, as a, a loving and lovable Christian, a Christian, a man or a woman, a child that really reflects the life and character of God. Are you willing to enter in with him with that? You long to have your heart cleansed and changed, to be transformed into his image. He's calling you to him now. What will you answer? Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. 
there's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange dim in the light of His glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, He promised. Believe Him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of His glory and grace. Let's pray together. Father, our Father, hallowed be your name. As we've been studying this Lord's Prayer today, we ask, Lord, that truly our prayers would be mingled with the righteousness of Christ, that they might be acceptable to you, that you'd show us in our own lives where we need the cleansing and the purifying that the water of your spirit brings. Father, do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Make us reflectors of the life of your grace that we truly might be heralds to other. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for your time, and I look forward to meeting you in another, another opportunity. May God bless. Mm -hmm.